thank you so much for coming to well i hope I'm, i hope i'm actually live um i don't know you're hearing me okay good okay great great um i'm jeff hunt uh i'm a professor of history at the community college of aurora i always want to get that out there because we're the community college no one's ever heard of best one in the <laughs> state so um uh i am not a veteran uh i'm i'm the baloney between veterans uh my father landed at d-day and uh my son just got out of the corps after 25 years and i sleep better <laughs> with him home well you know what i mean anyway um uh the um my dissertation uh which i eventually turned into that book which i'd love to sell um is um about the first Colorado volunteers in the um, Spanish-American War. I wanted to write about new Navy monitors. Uh, the last monitors built by the United States were built of steel, and the last one was completed in 1901. Um, but my uh, graduate committee at Boulder said, where would you get your information? I said, well, National Archives and Washington Navy are. They said, no, no, that won't work. Um, you need something where you can do your research here in Colorado. So they said, you should do the first Colorado. No one's ever done it. And that makes me the world's leading expert on the first Colorado in the Spanish-American War, because I'm the only one. <laughs> and so where did I do my research? National Archives and Carlisle, Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay. So someone could still do that book on the new Navy monitors. But anyway, um, so... Uh, I'm, my talk today, I, I can answer questions about the broader thing that happened in terms of uh, Colorado. Um, when the U.S. declared war on Spain uh, in 1898, the regulars all headed off for Cuba. And so everyone flocks to the colors to uh, save, the, uh, uh, save the nation's honor after the Maine blew itself up is the current interpretation uh, in Havana. Um, the slogan you learned in school was, remember the Maine. Um, they never tell you the second part. To hell with Spain. They didn't teach us that in fourth grade, you know. But um, with the regulars gone, they also then were calling in um, volunteer troops, like they did in the Civil War. And uh, right when the war started, um, the Secretary of the Navy made a mistake and left the office. And uh, while he was out of the office for the weekend, uh, the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, um, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, cabled to Commodore Dewey and said, go attack the Spanish fleet in, in Manila, and then resigned. Quit. There was a note. I sent Dewey to attack Manila. I'm going to go raise a regiment. All right, okay. So the Secretary of the Navy comes back and it's like, damn, that expanded fast. Um, anyway, um, and Dewey sailed into Manila Bay, May 3rd, and sank the Spanish fleet. Yeah. Uh, Spanish fleet considerately moved away from Manila so that shells from the American fleet didn't land in the city. And uh, uh, we did have one fatality. Uh, a man died of heat stroke uh, in that I mean, they broke off in the middle for breakfast, okay. They just sailed out of range, had breakfast, went back. Anyway, uh, but then um, Dewey landed his uh, Marines to take Cavite, the uh, naval hospital and arsenal, and, and then he was out of troops. Meanwhile, you have Filipinos all around uh, Manila, and there's 16,000 uh, Spanish troops in Manila, and a whole hoop of... Uh, Filipino insurgents on the outside. Uh, it's a low-grade insurgency, um, much less violent than what was going on in Cuba. They called them insurrectos. They had the same blockhouse system, big blockhouses within sight of each other that were bulletproof. They weren't artillery proof, but they were bulletproof. Um, oh, two-inch planks. And they were like 26 feet, 26 feet, 26 feet, you know, two levels. They were kind of cool. Anyway, um, the Filipinos couldn't get into the walled city of Manila, and the Spanish didn't dare go outside. So they'd shoot at each other, um, like over the wall, bang. Uh, the odds of getting hit 
uh, you might get hit by a comet. Okay, but, um, well, who wants to be the last person to die for empire? Um, anyway, so Colorado troops thought they were going to go to um, free the Cubans from Spanish oppression, and they ended up going to free the Filipinos from Spanish oppression, and then get caught up in um, what we call the Philippine insurrection, because that implies unjust resistance to a legitimate authority. They call it the Second Philippine War of Independence. So they end up killing Filipinos to bring them the blessings of American liberty. Awkward. Uh, in between, they didn't know they were going to be fighting the Filipinos. They started to figure it out, but they didn't know it. And, uh, but they were just hanging out. And they wanted to come home. If you look at America's soldiers going back to when we were still colonial soldiers fighting in the French and Indian Wars, we're good for the fighting, but once the fighting's done, we want to go home. And, uh, and you see that in the French and Indian Wars. You see it in the American Revolution. It's winter. Why do I want to go to Valley Forge? I'm going to go home. My mom will cook my meals. I'll plant. I'll be back right after planting. You know, it's an agricultural society. And it goes on, war after war, and you see it in World War II as well. Um, once the war's done, okay, we're done. Can we go home now? Uh, the only term that the military had for any kind of soldier protest was mutiny in the 19th century. And that's where the title, Mutiny in Manila, comes from. So that's my background on this. I will say one more thing. The Colorado troops served in America's first major overseas war for exactly one year in a tropical country in uh, a place where the people back home had no idea what it was about and didn't much care when they came home. Does that sound at all familiar? <laughs> yeah, just saying. I, you know, <laughs> As an historian, I look for these little, yeah. Well, actually, when they came home, they had tropical diseases. Um, but we had no doctors who knew anything about tropical diseases. Not a lot of tropics in the States. Uh, there were two guys that were just wasting away. They lived in Juanita, Nebraska, um, which is out towards Sterling and across the line. It's spelled W-A-U-N-E-E-T-A, -E -E Juanita, because we can't spell Spanish words. Anyway, um, and, um, and they were dying. And the doctor had no idea what to do, so he took them to the vet. And the vet said, well, if they were horses, I'd worm them. So they wormed them, saved their life. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's just, who knew? All right. So, uh, remember the main to hell with Spain. I've tried to get this as a tattoo, and, uh, but no one, no one will do it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, the badges were, were common. Uh, this is the wreck of the Maine before it was dragged out. After, uh, after the war, uh, the U.S. took it to sea uh, and dropped it in the channel between Key West and Havana. So it's still down there. Um, it is actually still in commission, the Maine is. It is the longest ship in the U.S. Navy. Okay, They raise a flag every day on its um, jack staff. Uh, which is in Key West in the middle of the main uh, burials. But the main mast is at Annapolis. They raise a flag on it every day. And uh, so one of the things the ensigns have to know is what is the longest ship in the U.S. Navy from Annapolis to Key West. Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was the deadliest uh, day uh, for the U.S. Navy um, until um, Pearl Harbor. Okay. Oh, that would be a whole other thing. Um, the current theory, the current theory is it blew itself up. Um, they had, it wasn't a bad ship, but it was a rusty ship, and it wasn't that old, but they had, um, they'd already had a problem with clinkers from the boilers bouncing through a hole and into a secondary magazine. This is a bad plan. Um, we, you know, we try to not have that happen. Um, some of the plates were buckled in, some were buckled out. Um, at the time, the U.S. assumed that somehow, after the Maine had personally selected where it was going to anchor, 
the Spanish somehow got a big mine underneath it and blew it up. Yeah, no one had the technology. Um, the current thing, uh, Admiral Hyman Rickover, um, father of the nuclear navy, he took his, his retirement job was to figure out what happened to the main. And the kind of the last conclusion is, yes, there are plates that are buckled in, but the explosion went out, hit the bottom of the uh, bay, and the, the shock wave came back up. Uh, but it blew, uh, for sure, and uh, sank, and so it's out there now, anyway. How many men were lost? 288 were lost, yeah. Um, so, the Colorado troops show up thinking they're going to fight the Spanish. They went into camp at, um, oh, there's a golf course at Colorado Boulevard and the interstate, Interstate 70. Yeah. Is that Park Hill? Okay. They camped there. That was their encampment. Um, and then they find out that they're going to go, they put out a call, we need troops if we're going to take Manila. And so Western troops get sent. Um, well, we didn't even have troop ships. We'd never needed one. Okay. Um, so these guys come from the prairie where they know 12 people and they assemble in Denver. Ooh, it's the big city, right? Then from there, from the big city of Denver, they troop on down. The average age at time of muster was 23. Okay. Um, Colorado's coming out of a depression. Uh, we had a National Guard whose main function was to shoot strikers, but under a populist governor, they'd gone and protected strikers and uh, made the, coal, uh, the uh, gold companies sit down and talk to the strikers. Um, that was uh, Davis Waite. Okay. After the Spanish-American War, they go back to shooting strikers. Anyway, uh, that leads to Ludlow. But, huh? Yeah. But, but for this little period of time here, they're suspicious of strikers. Uh, one of them, Harry Kerr, was a uh, Denver streetcar conductor and wore his conductor's badge when he went into battle. Um, and he led the uh, Filipino uh, horse car uh, conductors out on strike. And they asked him to stop. And uh, he just blew his bugle to encourage him. Yeah, anyway. But they said, he has union tendencies. <laughs> anyway, so they get onto uh, cars. Now, this is an adventure. They look a little bored, I admit. But they get on cars, and off they head across the Rockies, right? Across the prairies. Uh, they get to Oakland, which is where the railroad stopped. Everyone troops off, goes to the ferry building. They go across the biggest body of water they'd see in San Francisco Bay. And, uh, and then they get a big reception in San Francisco uh, from the people. And uh, they come back after lunch and find that they'd stacked arms. And the ladies of San Francisco had thrust a lily down the muzzle of each of, each of their rifles, uh, which they said was hell to clean them after that. <laughs> you know, they had this much rust down every barrel. But anyway, went into camp in uh, Golden Gate Park and um, marched up to the Cliff House, uh, went to the Sutro Baths. They're gone now. And eventually um, boarded ship. But here they are going across the prairie. I'm going to just show you one guy here. That guy there is Wendy Watson, the last survivor of the uh, Colorado troops. Wendy, B, his real name was William, because he could talk more than I do. So, um, and the VFW post number one has his footlocker and his personal stuff. Okay. Anyway. Jeff, did, sorry, we're going to talk about this. And I can't remember. Were these the gentlemen who started that, that post number? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, the veterans of foreign wars were founded by the first Colorado when they got back. Um, the, um, it was a little awkward. Signing up for the National Guard, it was kind of a marching and chowder society back then. You might go out on strike duty, but that'd be for two months. But it's kind of hard to leave your job forever to go off to a war. And so they enlisted a whole lot of new guys. And they were still state troops. 
And then they brought an officer over from Fort Logan, had everyone line up, said everyone who wants to uh, fight the uh, Spanish, um, march forward. And the entire unit marched forward when they crossed the street, then they signed muster rolls to go into the U.S. Army. Okay, so there was no First Colorado anymore. They took their um, breech-loading Springfield rifles. These are 45 70 uh, caliber, uh, 45 caliber, 70 grains of powder. Um, this is the Indian Wars weapon, and uh, they're a breech loader, so you can fire 12 shots a minute with it. Uh, black powder, heavy slug, uh, soft lead bullet, okay, which would be illegal today, right? Everything has to have a full metal jacket, but um, not a bad weapon. And actually, in the Philippines, um, an entire company using smokeless powder rounds, which would scare me, um, that the Army was experimenting with, uh, fired at 1,200 yards and killed one Filipino. We don't know who did it, but there were 80 guys firing, and they got him, or scared him to death. <laughs> we're not sure. <laughs> but the max range is 1,000 yards. With the smokeless powder, they managed to hit him at 1,200. Poor little guy. <laughs> anyway, um, they took Gatling guns with them. Because while it was an American who invented the machine gun, one of the things about machine guns is they use ammunition really fast. And the U.S. Army said, we can't afford, we can afford the gun, we can't afford the ammo. Um, one shot's all you need. Uh, so we didn't buy them. The, the Spanish were using Colt machine guns um, against us. Uh, they were using uh, Nordenfelt 57 uh, uh, millimeter guns that were breech loaders. Um, like a baby French 75, um, but they had 57 million. We were using 3.2 inch breech loading cannons developed from the Civil War, except now they were breech loaders. So we showed up for the 19th century, the Spanish showed up for the 20th century. That's how that one worked. Anyway, that's the troop ship. They just got Pacific mail ships, um, chartered them, built racks of bunks in them, three high, this is in the bow, four high somewhere else, and jammed them in there. Stuffed them in. Uh, the first Colorado went over on something called the China. Um, they got to Hawaii. Um, this is the main um, version I have. The other photograph, you notice that they didn't all have swimsuits. Uh, as they said, they um, they got to the beach and a bunch of Kanaka maids and matrons were riding on the waves on long boards in their birthday suits. They moved over to make us room. Okay. They loved Hawaii. They thought Hawaii was grand. Marching back, one guy fell out because of heat stroke, so his buddies stayed with him. And they said, um, a servant girl came out from um, a small house across the street and said that the queen has asked if you would like to come in to cool this man off. It was Queen, Lilioka, Queen Liliokalani's um, retirement home uh, after she was ousted from the Iolani Palace. And you know what the Iolani Palace is today, yes? Hawaii Five-O. <laughs> That's, that if you ever see the, movie, the show Hawaii Five-0, you wonder, why do the cops have such a nice place? Well, that's really the Hawaiian palace. So they went there, and off they went. On, here they are leaving the China. That's the troop ship they had. Leaving the China in a ship's boat to, um, huh? It is. Um, <laughs> and they're, they're headed for, uh, they took Wake Island. Um, there was no one home. Uh, there, was a, there was a pole there, a flagpole, so they raised an American flag. The only diary entry I have from one of these guys is, caught a big shark today, didn't mention Wake. Okay. Um, uh, the Nebraska troops had gone just before, they took Guam. And they shelled the fort. Uh, cruiser was the Boston, I think. Shelled the fort. Spanish didn't return fire. But in the middle of the bombardment, uh, a Spanish flag comes out from the fort. Um, and the uh, colonel in charge of Wake said, I can't return your salute. Uh, we have no ammunition. 
<laughs> okay. Glad we didn't hit you. Um, <laughs> how do you miss a fort? Okay. Um, seriously, between the Manila and the Battle of Santiago in Cuba, which sank the rest of the Spanish fleet, uh, the U.S. later in the after action figured for every 300 shells fired by the U.S. Navy, one actually hit the Spanish. Oops. <laughs> Oops. Um, and the range, I mean, you could kind of look through the barrel and fire, you know. Well, anyway. Um, and so um, the Spaniards said, well, I could pull my pistol and shoot at you for the honor of Spain. They said, let's not do that. He said, okay, we're done. Um, so that's how we got Wake and Guam. Collateral damage on this. All right. So they landed. Uh, they had to lighter from the ship uh, to shore. There were no docks for them. Uh, and, on, and then on the 13th day of August, 1898, uh, this is the first Colorado uh, coming up out of their um, improvised trenches to attack uh, the defenses of Manila. Um, when Dewey sailed in to the bay and sank the fleet, he had a proposal for the general in charge of Manila. He said, let's um, share the telegraph line, uh, the underwater cable, went to Hong Kong and then on. And that way we can both talk to our governments and we'll have the British be in charge of it. And the Spanish said, no, never. It's a Spanish uh, line. Never shall you use it. So Dewey said, watch this. Put a hook down, lifted it up, <laughs> and cut it. Okay. So Solve that problem. On the 12th day of August, Spain and the U.S., signed a ceasefire. So no one knew. And so the US troops are going to attack Manila a day after the war is over. Okay. Oops. Um, I have to conclude, most historians agree, that it was a, uh, a sham battle. Um, the uh, the U.S. shelled some forts, but they didn't shell the city. They didn't want to kill civilians. The Spanish didn't want them to kill civilians. Um, the Spanish pretended to fight back, and the U.S. pretended to fight them. However, the word didn't get down to the units in the field. They thought it was the real deal. Okay. Um, so, you know, at the general's end, we're just going to go through this, and then you can surrender with honor, and we'll keep the Filipinos from killing you afterwards. Um, I mean, they went home with their weapons and everything, you know. So it was probably a sham battle. Our guys didn't know it. The Spanish guys didn't know it. They thought they were getting shot at. And they were. Okay. So whatever the intent, um, they went in. The band, thinking that they were, it was all over, marched in behind them playing, it'll be a hot time in the old town tonight, <laughs> which was the top tune from 1897, okay, um, if you look at sheet music sales. By the way, the American troops who entered the uh, Forbidden City in the Boxer Rebellion, it'll be a hot time in the old town tonight. That's what the band was playing. Um, it, was, it seemed like the appropriate music when you're storming enemy cities. The 1898 one, a little less politically correct. All coons look alike to me. Okay, I've got the sheet music. Yeah. Anyway, they went in. They're carrying the 4570s. Okay. They raised that flag right there um, over Fort San Antonio de Abad. The fort still exists. It's a giant flower pot. Um, it's, a, it's a raised garden um, with um, a 15-story high-rise behind it. Manila has grown. So that's, that's what it is today. But the fort was there. Um, the shells you see, those came from um, Dewey's ships out in the harbor. Okay. So they did shell the fort. Uh, uh, the Colorado troops went in through the gate, shot some of the people inside when they fired on them, and then turned to uh, patching up the wounded. And then from there marched on to Manila. And moved into Manila, 
raised the first flag over the city proper, and now it's over. Okay, but they have to go out to um, what they called outposts. Um, they moved into the Philippine trench lines and then dug new ones because the Filipinos weren't real careful in their own trenches about finding a latrine. So they were a little ripe, so the U.S. troops made a new set of trenches. Filipinos then made a new set of trenches outside because they're waiting for the U.S. to turn the Philippines over to them. Uh, Henry Teller from uh, Central City, Senator Teller had put in our war message that if we conquered Cuba, captured it from the Spanish, that within two years we would turn uh, Cuba free. It's not a war for imperialism. Okay? Didn't say anything about Puerto Rico, or the Philippines, or Wake, or Guam, or yeah. But, but that was in there. Filipinos thought they were going to get turned loose. Japan is expanding, and Germany has finally figured out they need a fleet because they're trying to have colonies, and they were late to the game. So you've got Germans in the uh, harbor. You've got Japanese ships in the harbor, and the British are saying, I wouldn't mess with Dewey. Um, he will sink your ships, and we'll have a war. And so they say, yeah, we were just visiting. But um, one idea was if the U.S. just sails away, then the Philippines will be conquered by Germany or by um, Japan, to which the anti-imperialists in, in, in America said, so? That's our problem. How? Anyway. So here is Company A. Uh, that is John Stewart, the highest ranking officer of the 1st Colorado to be killed in uh, the war. Um, and they're marching, out to, uh, they're marching to the outposts. See the little white things on their hats? Okay, they're wearing the same uniform I am but they have mosquito nets that they've pulled up on top, okay? Um, the Colorado troops wore a blue wool uniform, kind of like a Civil War uniform that you've got back here, but with a five-button wool sack coat instead of a four-button Civil War one. But it's wool, which is outerwear, right? I mean, what else are you going to wear? Um, but they had concluded that that was kind of heavy duty. And so um, they were issued, while they were in San Francisco, what they called their pajamas. Um, they loved these because they were light. They're, it's a khaki, um, sort of a jean cloth kind of uh, cloth that came out of the Indian Wars period. Um, it's a fatigue uniform. Uh, oh, they're dress uniforms. Not many had them, but officers did. They had spiked helmets. Um, the old U.S. infantry spiked helmets. and. Uh, no, and on the front of the spiked helmets was that uh, that badge. Um, they were good-looking helmets. Uh, foot soldiers had spiked helmets. Mounted soldiers, artillery had horsehair plumes. Very nice. Very nice. They looked pretty. They did look pretty. Uh, artillery had red. Cavalry had yellow. And the Indian scouts had half red and half white. How cool is that? <laughs> How cool is that? That's very sharp. But um, these are citizen soldiers. Um, most of them did not have dress uniforms. They had the blue wool suits. They got the pajamas on the way over. They said there were only two sizes, um, small and large. Um, <laughs> but I've got a picture in the book of this small recruit holding up this giant pair of pants. You know, I mean, it's just huge. Um, <laughs> just going, I don't know what to do with this, you know. But Anyway, um, so here they are going out to outpost, and it's um, and it's they they've got a dog following them. They took their pets with them. They took a goat with them. They named him Dewey. Um, they had a uh, bulldog that they smuggled on board in the bell of the tuba, punk, <laughs> and carried him on. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's kind of a scrubby looking dog. Well. The officers bought Philippine horses when they got there. But a Filipino pony is like, they're, you know, the, the feet were dragging in, the, the stirrups were dragging in the dirt. Yeah. Um, they also had monkeys. Um, monkeys, and I haven't gotten a good picture of, uh, of a macaque from this time. I'm doing okay on time? Okay. Um, they're about this big. And... Uh, uh, the ladies have mustaches and the gentlemen have beards. And um, uh, they're big macaques, long tail. And uh, 
They had a number of them, but one who had to be the Einstein of his race, they named Zeke Spivens. Zeke Spivens. Zeke lived with uh, Color Sergeant Dick Holmes and uh, in his tent and uh, had his own tin cup. And whenever the men would line up for food, Zeke would get in line. So they lined up for their quinine ration, and they weren't mixing it with gin and tonic yet. You know, it was just quinine, pretty bitter stuff. And first sergeant got in line to show the men if he could do it, they could do it, and drank the stuff down. And Zeke got in line behind, and he drank his down, and he screwed up his little face, went running into the nearest tent, grabbed gun rags, and started wiping his tongue. Okay. <laughs> He also recognized shoulder boards, and he noticed that the men would always salute when an officer went by. So an officer would be walking through camp, and the men would be saluting. So Zeke, who also knew the manual of arms, he'd fall in at the end of the line with a stick. And okay. Whenever he saw an officer, he'd salute. And the officer would reflexively come, oh, gosh, <laughs> And, of course, the men thought that was great fun. Yeah. Okay, enter Dr. Rose Kid Beer. Uh, Dr. Beer was a military brat. Um, her, uh, her father was Meredith Kidd, Colonel of the 10th uh, U.S. Cavalry, Black uh, Regiment. Um, she grew up at Fort Larned, Fort Sill. Uh, she learned to shoot, she learned to ride. And when the war came out, oh, by then she had married um, Dr. Beer. She had become a doctor herself at a time when there were not many women doctors. And, um, and she had two sons, and her husband died. Uh, her father had been on the Dawes Commission for the Utes, where they parted out the reservations. Um, she was a Westerner and uh, was running the state home for basically orphans. Uh, first woman to run a Colorado State uh, institution. Anyway, her dad uh, wrote her from back in Indiana and said, this is the first war that will not have a um, kid in it from the French and Indian War to now. There's always been a kid. I'm too old to go. Um, your boys are too young. She said, sending the boys to you, I'm going. Okay, And she got... Uh, she got uh, in front of um, Wes Merritt, uh, named a conjure with from the Indian Wars, and he agreed to send her. Okay, so uh, she's a doctor. Okay, she'd sailed over on a on a subsequent ship, so she wasn't there for the fall of Manila, but the troops are still there, and the report is that they're sick. Okay, so when she got to the Republic of Hawaii. Um, Grover Cleveland had refused to absorb Hawaii after uh, uh, Sanford Dole had uh, overthrown the government of uh, the Republic of, uh, you know, Lily Okalani. Um, said, no, we don't do that. We don't just go take over someone else's country. Um, so um, Sanford Dole didn't give it back. He just set up the Republic of Hawaii and waited for the U.S. to catch up. Anyway, it's still a republic. Rose's lime juice was not available in the United States, but it was available in the Republic of, of Hawaii, so Rose Kid Beer loaded up case after case after case of Rose's lime juice and stacked them under her bunk on the uh, ship, figuring that it would be useful to care for the Colorado troops when she got there. She was not uh, paid. Um, the Soldiers' Aid Society agreed to uh, give her a dollar a day for expenses, but she's a volunteer. Okay. Uh, Rose's lime juice was originally made in the Caribbean. Okay. Did she work in Colorado as a, as a doctor? She did in Colorado beforehand and after. Was it with St. Anthony's by chance? No. No, she had a, a... You think we got a lot of hospitals now? We used to have a lot of hospitals, a lot of little private ones, because of the tuberculosis. Um, that's why we're so over-hospitaled is people thought if you came here, the dry air would cure you. Um, that's a whole nother talk. Uh, anyway, when she got there, they were so glad to see an American woman. Um, the military brass, who were enjoying being in charge of, of a, a little male army, you know, in an era in which uh, mothers were celebrated uh, to an extraordinary degree, which is also why men's 
lodges were so popular. Okay, all male, a separate sphere. Anyway, they had a medical corps. That got taken away by the U.S. Army and sent to Cuba. Um, so they sent a couple of doctors and a couple of hospital stewards. But um, they didn't want anything to do with a woman doctor. So she said, well, I'm here as a nurse. They didn't want anything to do with a woman, with a woman nurse. California had sent like 10 nurses. Oregon had sent two. So Rose Kid Beer fell in with the nurses, and they set up their own hospital, a convalescent hospital, we'd call it. It's a tent hospital. But the men were sick. The rations were wretched. They're trying to get them to eat well on hard crackers and beans kind of hard to recover, so they set up what they called a light diet kitchen. She used the money she had to first jury rig a stove and then buy a stove so they could cook food for these guys. And then the, uh, the colonel of the regiment said, well, um, I don't know who you are. You don't have any credentials. So she handed over the credentials. And well, I, you know, and um, he said, but I've got a great idea. I'm going to set up a light diet kitchen. And uh, so he set up his own competing. But the soldiers wouldn't go to it because they were getting better care from the nurses. So you got a little bit of tension going there. Um, their colonel when they went over was uh, Irving Hale. Uh, his father uh, was the first faculty member at CU Boulder. Hale Hall is named after the father. Uh, Irving Hale was a West Point graduate. Um, he got the highest score ever on the final exam uh, before commissioning. Um, the score was like 5,000. He got 4,999.5. He failed to cross a T. Okay. Um, he was trained in what they called electrical torpedoes. Um, not self-propelled torpedoes, what they called an underwater mine back then was still a torpedo. These are command detonated. You put them in your harbor, and then when the Japanese cruiser comes over it as it's attacking your city, you blow it up. Well, he learned all about electricity, came here, and became state's head of GE, General Electric. Then he went in for the uh, war. Uh, the Zaria Theater, uh, I only, this is the only picture I found of it, but um, Rose Kid Beer was so popular with the Colorado troops that they went in. She was escorted in uh, by one of the officers and uh, got a standing ovation. And um, she was very popular. And the Filipino minstrels had been taught to perform in blackface the song, All Coons Look Alike to Me, which the American soldiers thought was really quite hilarious. Um, the men drank uh, what the natives called vino uh, was uh, actually uh, made from palm uh, liquor and was more like gin than wine. Anyway, it's a distilled spirit. And that is an actual vino stand picture taken by a member of the first Colorado. Uh, the, their organic artillery was uh, Utah. And they were all named Young, all of them. And uh, he said those red-whiskered whisk, red -whiskered Mormons were extraordinarily fond of Filipino vino. So, yeah. Well, the, the, the letter of law doesn't come down until 1930, uh, saying no alcohol. I mean, Brigham Young distilled whiskey. So, okay. What they ate was um, the Army bean, only um, they called it the Navy bean. It's the white bean. Okay, they ate a lot of beans. They ate moldy oatmeal. Okay, yum. And they ate hard crackers. By this time, in the Civil War, it was called hard crackers. By this time, it's called hard tack. Uh, hard tack is a really good product. In World War I, our men in the trenches in France were issued Civil War hard tack, and it had lost none of its flavor and nutritional value in the intervening time. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, the smart captains took all this stuff because they found out the Filipinos liked it and they traded for real food. Um, they were getting uh, canned beef from Argentina. Uh, this is a crate from them. There's the uh, can. 
Uh, when the men complained about the food, their commanding officer, oh, General Hale, Colonel Hale got promoted after the assault on Manila. He became a general, and so um, a subsequent, the, the colonel, the lieutenant colonel then became colonel. It was all political. Anyway, and they hated the colonel. Anyway, he said, these are the best rations ever eaten by any soldiers anywhere in the modern world. And Rose Kid Beer stormed the officer's mess with freshly opened cans of Argentinian corned beef and dumped the maggots, still alive, on the table in front of the officers. Cleared the room. Said, yeah, yeah. Later, they say, all this problem is because of Rose Kid beer. And one of the officers from the back of the room said, yeah, and she probably put the maggots in that uh, corned beef, too, you think? Yeah. Anyway. But you could trade a can of corned beef, and that can's about this big, for that many bananas. Okay. Um, Filipinos had a lot of turkeys. Um, they traded for a lot of turkeys. They traded for a lot of goats. Uh, Filipinos liked hard crackers. So, um, so the men decided they wanted to complain. They wanted to send a note home. But they're afraid that the officers will punish them if they complain, because that would be a mutiny, right? So, they met two men from each company. They had ten companies. So you got twenty men, and they asked Rose Kid Beer to meet them in the church belfry. So they can be sure no officer is listening to them. And she says, look it, I can carry a message, but I can't tell you what to do. Um, this is your campaign. I'm a civilian here. Um, it's not my job to, to foment um, insurrection. Okay. So the men wrote this. I will read it. To Governor Adams, representatives to Congress and the press and the people of the state, provided pieces declared, regiment earnestly desires recall. Rations are wretched and insufficient. 15% of the regiment is sick, will cheerfully remain for fighting, reluctant to serve for garrison duty. Answer. 1,000 Colorado volunteers. Napoleon Guillo, chairman. Okay. They couldn't say the entire regiment because... The colonel's company from his hometown wouldn't sign. Okay, so immediately the colonel uh, arrested Napoleon Guillot. But but he sent uh, he sent Lieutenant Colonel Moses, who was very popular, to talk to the men and get them to cool off for a day, and then they could send the telegram the next day if they wanted to. Well, they didn't cool off, so the next day they went to sell it, and um, the colonel had. Um, shut down, no, the general, the commanding general of the Philippines had shut down the telegraph office. No soldiers were allowed to post anything from the telegraph. Okay? So, well, that'll take care of it. I mean, a thousand men can't figure out a way to get a message out. Uh, in Denver Public Library, I found a uh, kind of a day timer, Victorian day timer, and a corporal said, so I sent the kick, as they called it, um, off to Hong Kong with a five pound note. Uh, in my laundry. And so they're sending their laundry to Hong Kong, getting it back, um, asking them to send it. Rose Kid Beer, I think, also handed it to a British journalist. Um, that telegram, three different versions of it, landed on the governor's desk uh, on the same day. So it went out and back. Okay. Ooh, that gets lively. Um, Major General Elwell Otis fought Indians in the West. There were 33 generals that fought uh, the Filipinos. 30 of those 33 had fought Indians in the West. Two of the other three were Westerners. Okay. So what they knew about fighting Filipinos was what they knew about fighting Indians. Okay. Uh, Elwell didn't know much about volunteer soldiers. Anyway. Um, the food was bad. They're looking forward to their Thanksgiving boxes. Thanksgiving came and went. No boxes. The ships that were supposed to have their Thanksgiving boxes sent by the people of Colorado were in the harbor. No one could find them. Quartermaster went out and climbed through the holds. Could not find them. Uh, so the officers said, well, this is not good. So they, they put their own money in 
and augmented the company funds, and everyone got a turkey dinner. And, uh, and uh, cigars were half a cent there. Uh, so the people from Colorado thinking they needed cigars were sending them cigars. And they end up saying, don't send us cigars. Send us Greeley potatoes. We want potatoes from Greeley. That's what we want. Uh, the Thanksgiving boxes showed up two days later. The tall man there in the center is Dick Holmes, the flag planting plant fool. Uh, wherever he went, he'd whip out an American flag and claim that particular thing for the U.S. Anyway, um, but they're all their Christmas boxes, and they were somewhat happier. Okay, now, this whole thing is um, creating a stir at home because the head of the Colorado National Guard back here says, that woman's just a troublemaker. Everything's going fine. The officers tell me it's great. Um, there's nothing wrong. Uh, it's all going to be fine. Uh, the men aren't really unhappy. And the telegraph starts blasting back and forth. You know. Plus, they'd write a letter and send it home. It's like pulling the pin on a grenade and throwing it and wait, wait wait and then you know weeks later it would arrive and get printed in the paper so Otis said he would court-martial any soldier who communicated with a newspaper so the soldiers communicated with their parents who communicated with a newspaper <laughs> right um, <laughs> uh, one guy wrote a number of inflammatory things it was private Alf Alpha Think about the name, alfalfa. Okay, um, so they didn't know who to, who to punish there. Um, one guy said, everything's fine, everyone's just complaining, everything's really fine. And his, um, his uh, company mates said, yeah, everything's fine. And they dumped him head first down the latrine. Oh. Um, so Elwell Otis um, broke the sergeants down to private and put the privates in the guardhouse for 10 days. And then the letter appeared in the Denver paper saying, our, um, our officers um, are really enjoying the power they have over their fellow citizens. But this war will end. We will go home. We do know where there's tar and a fire. <laughs> Just saying. Not threatening anyone, but we will all be civilians at some point. And then the colonel of the regiment went, oh, Colonel McCoy was like, wait, wait, wait. We recognize that we're going back, but we need to maintain discipline, yada, yada. Anyway, there's one of the Spanish blockhouses. That was the one immediately facing the American lines, uh, the Colorado lines, rather. Uh, the blockhouses were numbered from the bay around. The ships, um, the guns of the U.S. Navy took care of blockhouses number one, two, three, four. Um, one blockhouse just got a hit from a 13-inch shell from a monitor, one of the new Navy monitors, and just all that was left were the four corner posts. That was it. It was just like, boom, gone. But this was out of range and around the corner. And so um, they stormed it. What happened was on the night of uh, 5 February, um, a Nebraska trooper was guarding one end of a bridge, a Filipino sentry at the other end of the bridge, um, two of the Filipinos come across and um, Private William Grayson of the 1st Nebraska said, halt. And the Filipino, one of the Filipinos uh, responded, alto, um, halt, alto. And Grayson shot him. And then went running back in through the camp saying, the niggers are in the lines, uh, out, of, out of bed and uh, into ranks. Uh, we don't we don't broadcast those stirring words at the start of a war. But that starts the Philippine insurrection. So everyone's shooting back and forth all night long. And there's some humor in that, in that um, the U.S. troops had started, uh, when they go through for their rations, um, they would say, uh, mucho bueno, uno mas, por favor. It was a joke, because they didn't really like it. Well, Filipinos, um, U.S. would fire, and uh, uh, the Filipinos would fire, and the American troops would yell, Mucho bueno! And, uh, and then when the uh, U.S. troops would fire, the Filipinos would yell, Uno mas, por favor. <laughs> Another one, please. So they're, they're shooting uh, at each other, but, but they were used to fighting the Spanish, who weren't going to go out and, and fight in the open. As soon as dawn came up, um, 
the American line stormed the Filipino lines and actually got about three miles through them. Uh, burned 16 villages that day and got all the people out, but set fire to the Nipah huts. Uh, so Blockhouse 5 is the one they took. Okay. Anyway, um, they fought the Filipinos from February 5th until the 4th of July and then were rotated home. Um, they lost 26 men over there, one to suicide, one to drowning, um, mostly to disease. Some were shot. Uh, um, John Stewart was uh, shot. They got me, boys, right here and died. Um, the first Colorado came back on one ship. Uh, they landed in San Francisco, which had given them a great send-off. Uh, everyone turns out for it. Uh, Guy Sims, one of the Juanita boys, uh, was so sick he couldn't march. So he went down and sat on some packing crates uh, behind the crowd. And an old uh, GAR veteran uh, was there with his GAR uniform, you know, and his GAR badge, uh, Grand Army of the Republic, uh, Union Civil War veteran and uh, with his two daughters with him. And he said, those boys, um, you know, they've been gone for a year. They have no idea what a war is like, right? And then, okay, the gangplanks come down, troops come off. Um, the wounded are carried off in stretchers. Uh, a hatch opens and a steam hoist starts carrying the coffins out, okay? Because they dug them up from the uh, Sampalaka Cemetery and brought them home. And... Uh, and Dick Holmes is carrying the colors, but in the, in the tropical atmosphere, they wouldn't hang from the flagstaff anymore. The uh, silk had deteriorated. So he had to put them over the flagstaff and carry it sideways. Okay. But uh, they came home, dead and alive, together. Uh, the old man said, oh God, those colors, those colors. Turned around. And there was Guy Sims, shook his hand, um, and off they went. The men chose to be mustered out in San Francisco, counting on the state of Colorado then, giving them travel pay back to Colorado and taking them back to Colorado. So they have trying to augment their pay a bit. Colorado didn't have really the money, um, but they worked out some free railroad transportation. They wanted to give them medals. They didn't have money to print medals either. The uh, state of Colorado back then didn't have a lot of money. Unlike the state of Colorado today, which is just rolling in dough. Right. Anyway. Whoop. And so, they struck medals for them. Each man has his name on it. Came with a certificate. I didn't, didn't bring the certificate. But, um, Rather ominously on the back side, on the obverse, it says, uh, Dolce decorum est pro patria mori. It is sweet and dignified to die for the fatherland. <laughs> anyway, um, but they got these. And um, the way they paid for this, and the way they paid for getting them home, was they took all of the Sharps carbines that had been used by the 3rd Colorado at the uh, Sand Creek Massacre, and they auctioned them off to the public. And so those were all sold so the state would have enough money to bring the new troops home. I know, you shake your head. It's just like, really? Really? Uh, they had been in the Eighth Corps. And so when you see these little enameled eights, uh, that's the Philippine troops. Okay? Anyone who served in the Philippines. Um, however, the First Colorado had a special uh, Corps badge. They were the first to face uh, Spanish Mausers. And so, they were allowed to wear a Mauser cartridge in their hat band. Um, they fall out. So after I lost two, I thought, I'm not going to do that anymore. But this particular one has a pin on the back, like a safety pin, and it says, Surrender of Manila, August 13th, 98. They turned that into a, a pinnable badge. I've seen two of them. I own one of them. <laughs> So, um, uh, so they came back, and um, they stopped off in Pueblo, and were cheering for Rose Kid Beer, 
Uh, three cheers for Rose Kid Beer. Three cheers for Lieutenant uh, Colonel Moses. And someone said, uh, three cheers for Colonel McCoy. And you hear three voices, woo, woo, woo. <laughs> yeah, their colonel was very unpopular. After that, she said, didn't we sit down hard on McCoy in Pueblo? Uh, and this quote came from her. The American soldier can fight harder, die gamer, swear stronger, and get drunker than any soldier on earth. Fancy a little thing like a censorship keeping him from saying what he has set out to say. Viva los Americanos. She was here already by then. She was back home. Um, in the end, the Soldiers Aid Society said, um, you can consider yourself fired. She had to remind him, you're not paying me. <laughs> I'm a volunteer. <laughs> um, I'll come home when I'm done doing what I need to do. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. We didn't pay her anything, did we? <laughs> um, in the end, though, she did resign uh, with an eloquent telegram. Two words. Resigned. Beer. And she'd come home. Okay. So she was here when they finally got back. And then they went to Denver. Had a fancy, fancy... Um, Banquet in an unfinished building, which today is REI. Um, it was the power plant for the, uh, for the uh, electrical trolley, um, not the rope one. The rope one was, um, its power plant was the spaghetti factory. But for the new electric line, it wasn't completed yet. And so they set up in there and uh, had a great banquet and went back to their civilian lives. They formed a number of voluntary associations very quickly. Um, they did, they crossed the uh, date line, and so they had a mystic order, as they called it, where they patted and encouraged to the initiates inside. <laughs> that kind of patting, you know, it's like crossing the equator. Yeah. Um, uh, the officers created a order of the Philippines. In, in, in the end, there was United Spanish War veterans, but you had to be a veteran. There was no provision for offspringers, so you knew they were going to die off. Um, and so uh, there was also the Army of the Philippines. And they met up in Chicago and had a big conference because they said, we're all going to die. How do we move forward? And they decided to form a new outfit called Veterans of Foreign Wars. And uh, everyone was mad at their senior leadership for merging. Uh, so the guy they elected to be in charge was a Coloradoan named Rice Means. He was the first uh, commander of the Veterans of Foreign War. Okay. He was in charge of the social committee, and he was putting on all the parties. And they said, you know, that guy knows how to put on a party. We want him to be our first national. Hale was a national commander, and Gus Hartung was a national commander. Uh, all three are buried at Fairmount Cemetery. Okay. Um, the state bought land at Fairmount for uh, those veterans. Uh, the ones that they brought home mainly are buried at Fairmount. In a little circle around their flagpole, there's a statue of a guy dressed like this, up there. And then over time, as the rest died, many of them were put in place. You can tell a Spanish-American war vet because... You stop this minute. I think the battery died. <laughs> <laughs> He's a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, the, um, you can tell a Spanish-American War military headstone because um, the shield is incised uh, into the, 
it's not just the name, uh, like on a Civil War one. The shield is actually set back and recessed. So you'll see them all around town uh, for the guys who serve there. Anyway, um, that became VFW post number one, and uh, it still exists. Okay. Uh, I think that could be it. Oh, there's a, a welcome home pin. I didn't bring that one, but that's mine. We are proud of our Colorado boys. Uh, Rose Kid Beer died in 1927. She set up, uh, when she got back, she was very controversial, but she set up her own uh, nursing home for veterans um, and uh, expanded it uh, after World War I for the World War I vets coming back. Um, and then she died in Washington, D.C. Uh, one of her sons was a uh, colonel in the Army. Uh, she went to live with him, and uh, she was buried in Wabash, Indiana. Uh, Captain Locke put out a call for loot, and uh, it was to go into the War Relics Room, which was in the southwest corner of the Capitol building. Uh, there was room in there because they'd taken all of the Spanish or they'd taken all the Sand Creek uh, weapons out. So, this is some of the stuff that he collected. Okay, you see bolo knives, spears, guns, lots of things. Yeah. Is that still around today? That collection? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, the flag is probably going on exhibit. Uh, I there's been a problem because the Colorado Historical doesn't always because they use interns and work study students and things like that, sometimes their identification and stuff is a little odd, um, sometimes. <laughs> uh, so when we tried to do our Civil War reenactment unit, when we wanted to copy a flag, the one they showed us was in really bad shape, but we copied it. Um, and it says in the white, written in the white, it says uh, first colo, uh, U.S. volunteers. Well, that's the Spanish-American war flag. So we've got a great replica of the Spanish-American war flag. Um, they have now successfully identified the original colors uh, from the Civil War and from the Spanish-American War. They've been conserved because they needed support and are going to be suitable for exhibition coming up. Yes, sir? Were you running around then with a La Glorieta Pass reenactment? Um, I, do, uh, I do Civil War reenacting. There's about four of us who have this uniform, but we get dressed up and there's nowhere to go. I mean, <laughs> there's, there's no Filipino reenactors, you know. <laughs> Hi, we want to shoot at you. We don't want to be shot at, you know. I mean, um, yeah. Did you mention the, uh, how the Colorado boys got along with the Minnesota people? Overall, very well. However, there was, there's one great story from the Minnesota troops. Um, they were on town patrol, and um, one of the uh, Coloradoans stuck his head around a corner and said, psst, 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 come over here. Psst, psst. So the guy goes walking over there, and the Colorado boys have bought a barrel of beer. And they're all sticking their cups in and drinking beer. And uh, the Minnesota boy was teetotal. And he thought in his position as a town guard, he should prevent anyone else from not being teetotal. So he kicked over their barrel of beer. And the thing was on, as he said. Um, so the Minnesotans sail in to save their teetotal, uh, overzealous uh, town guard, and the Colorado are fighting back. He said, but, you know, we, we had the muskets and the bayonets. They just had fists, so, you know. Um, so generally they got along. They don't steal the Coloradans' beer. Um, uh, partway through, now they were up against... Spaniards with the 1895 Mauser. Yeah, things to check every once in a while, you know. Um, this is 1895. The 98 Mauser is much more famous, but this is the first one. And uh, it still is, it just glides back. It's really a very nice action. But you always got this bolt sticking out. It's, you know, you can always tell a Mauser because this thing is sticking out to the side. But um, basically, uh, 30 caliber. Uh, this one is actually from the Chilean army. They did not take wonderful care of it over the years. Uh, 
it belonged to someone who painted on it. Somewhere here there's a, oh, red paint. And his number, yep, red paint. And the number of that particular private. Uh, Sportsman's Guide bought a bunch of them really cheap, bored them out and, uh, to get rid of the rust. That's all they could do uh, to get rid of the pitting. And bored them out so they take a 308 round, uh, NATO round. And ammo's cheap, okay. Um, the crag was what the regulars used. And uh, it, to get around the Mauser patent, they bought this Danish produced weapon, which has an external box magazine. It's basically a fake Mauser. Um, we eventually decided to pay the uh, cost and uh, bought the patent, and that became the 1903 Springfield. But this is what the regulars had. There were none available uh, when the first Colorado went over. And so, um, partway through, just as they went into the Philippine insurrection, they got 300 of them and handed them out um, 30 to a company to the best marksman. But the bullets won't fit. I mean, they fall through the uh, loops of the, uh, of the cartridge belt. So what they would do is um, carry them in their pockets, spare cartridges in their pockets. Okay. So, yeah. So at this time, the bottom third of Colorado was still Spanish-speaking. Yeah. There were some men that came from Nebraska, but were there any that came from Southern Colorado that spoke Spanish? And if so, did that, did they, did that? Like some of the recruiting officers wouldn't enlist Catholics, okay? And uh, the Catholic diocese, uh, uh, the bishop, went to the governor and said, this sucks. And so they started enlisting Catholics, but they had to order it. Um, the people who spoke Spanish were not Colorado Hispanics. They were people who'd, who'd been somewhere else. It was kind of interesting. 10% of the regiment chose not to come home. Um, they stayed in the Philippines. Uh, they found Filipino ladies quite attractive and formed uh, personal relationships. They married overseas. Hey, it's a new frontier. They saw room, I mean, one of them set up a newspaper. He'd been a newspaper man here. They set up a newspaper. Um, they stayed over there. They loved California. By 1920, a bunch of them were living in the Sawtell Veterans Colony in, in L.A., which is a little separate town in the middle of L.A. My folks were cops there, and um, they'd say, going through Sawtell. So they're not available on a call then as they drive through. <laughs> but they loved California. Uh, San Francisco and Oakland would give them a great... Uh, uh, a great uh, welcome. Uh, another guy, Bob White. Um, some people showed up in uh, San Francisco when they were still there saying, uh, hi, we're looking for Fred Schwartz or whatever. And someone said, I think I may know where he is. Bob White came in, saw these people who knew him from the old times, turned white as a ghost and ran away. So they got back to San Francisco. He immediately took ship to Hawaii. Um, so he was running from something. Uh, Fred Reed was um, eventually um, a police chief in Denver. He wasn't really Fred Reed. He was one of these veterans. And he was, um, he'd been convicted of murder under another name. And so he changed his name and became a police chief. Um, uh, um, all across the country, a lot of the veterans of the Spanish-American War become the uh, nexus of the KKK. Um, so the Bisbee, Arizona thing, that was all first Colorado guys. Or no, not first Colorado, Spanish-American War vets. They were fighting Spanish. Um, I grew up, I'm the last Victorian. I grew up in a private school that used McGuffey's readers, okay? And I've got a set of those, but as I look back on it, I realize Span people who spoke Spanish carry knives, and they're cowardly and untrustworthy. That's the propaganda that Americans were raised on. Remember, we were born as an anti-Catholic country. I mean, we're on, what, our 45th president? A third of the population is Catholic? We've had one Catholic president? Huh. 
It's buried in our psyche from the French and Indian Wars. Our first English colony failed because of the Spanish Armada. I mean, it's ingrained in American culture, anti-Catholicism. So, uh, first Colorado was not real sympathetic to the Catholic priests. Well, they threw them out of their con uh, out of their quarters and took them over, um, and had to be ordered to let the priests back into their homes and give back their furniture. You know that kind of thing, making friends everywhere they went. Yeah. Okay. Any final questions for John? If this is a whole new talk, you can skip it. But what's the connection with sugar? Is there? With sugar? Yeah, I'm just thinking like the, you know, the sugar beet industry that comes a little later, but how... Is there none? None. Okay. Um, except that Sanford Dole, who we now know for pineapple, what they were really growing back then was sugar. Okay, that was the money. Uh, sugar, it's, it's, that's a whole nother talk. But, you know, cocoa, coffee, and tea hit Europe at about 1600. And the amount, they're all bitter. And the amount of sugar that Europe consumed then um, from 1600 to 1700 went up 32 times. Someone had to grow that. Huh. Maybe we ought to have slaves. Huh. Oh, maybe we'll have a civil war because of cocoa. Huh. Everything's connected. Everything's connected. Yep. Well, John, thank you so yeah. much for being Thanks for having me. Yeah. I would like to present you one oh. of our challenge coins here. I'm not going to carry with this with me every day, and if I don't have it on me, buy drinks for everyone. <laughs> well, we hope all of you will stick around afterwards. The one thing, just before we split, I'm going to take uh, about two minutes to talk about Who? something else. Uh, Thank you. you. brought up the idea of uh, you know, Philippine insurrection and stuff. Uh, I have a bunch of relatives going way back when. And on my wife's side, uh, Michael Joseph Lenahan was a West Point class 1887. His so first assignment, in fact, most regular army officers back then, oh yeah, I mean, <laughs> that is what you preach. Okay. Or stand really close to John. <laughs> <laughs> the, assi okay. yeah. we're, the, assi we're the assignment most army officers, regular army officers, could expect in the 1880s was being sent out to the various forts out west. And his first assignment was Fort Assiniboine, the Indian Territory in Montana. And the regimental commander of the 20th Regiment who was out there was Colonel Elwell Otis. Should sound familiar. Uh, again, what, you know, at that time, the size of the army was 25,000 roughly. And where were they all? Scattered in all the forts around here. So when the, certainly when the Spanish-American War started, once again, we had to scramble to assemble a much larger force, and that is Again, the first Colorado and so many others. What? Okay, all right. Well, good. by that time, you know, after 15 years in the Army, he was now a captain and was sent off at the beginning of the Spanish-American War uh, to join the 2nd Infantry Regiment at Anniston, Alabama. And they were shipped off to Cuba. So he got involved in the Spanish-American War a year later, came back, was assigned to the 25th Infantry at Fort Logan, Colorado. And shortly after getting there, the 25th Infantry was shipped to the Philippines. And so, you know, d Captain Lenahan at that point now has been involved in two wars there. Uh, the comment in a little diary maintained was once the insurrection started, it seemed that every tree was shooting at us. Uh, and that's exactly it. You know, it turned into a major counterinsurgency. Some of the actions we took as our forces out there, you know, were terrible when you look back at it. I mean, in many cases, we rounded civilians up, put them into essentially camps uh, where thousands died just from disease and things. As things got nasty, you know, which we saw in Vietnam as well, uh, quite often, you know, 
the Philippine guerrillas would take, do atrocities on our soldiers that they would capture and we would re reciprocate in kind. But in any event, so once again, you run in this uh, relative who actually was involved in this. Uh, and he came back, when he came back from the Philippines, where did the regular officers go? Back to the forts out on the west. Uh, fortunately, uh, at that time, Colonel Lenahan uh, had a chance to be in the War Department for a while. And at the start of World War II, he commanded one of the brigades of the 42nd Infantry Division, which was the famous Rainbow Division, and took that to France and participated in, oh, the Battle of Champagne, Arnt's Mine, uh, Marne in support of the French, uh, Second Battle of the Marne, Saint Mihiel Offensive, and then subsequently took over another brigade uh, for the last major offensive. And this picture here is, uh, at that time, Brigadier General Lenahan uh, leading the 153rd Brigade of the 77th Division in parade down Fifth Avenue uh, as the welcome home at the end of World War I. But again, you know, it's a small world. If we all look back, you know, at ma many of our relatives and the history they have, it's well worth researching and looking at. So again, thank you so much, John. I do want to uh, say, in defense of the First Colorado, uh, Aguinaldo, who led the uh, insurrection, uh, he thought he was a military mastermind, and he'd, he'd read all about Napoleon, and so he was trying to conduct conventional military operations against the Americans. Um, the U.S. troops came back July 4th, they left, or Colorado troops came back on July 4th, about July 20th, he said, we've got to switch over and do this as a guerrilla war, and that's when things got nasty. Uh, the first Colorado actually came back with their honor intact. Um, couldn't find any evidence of them torturing people. Uh, the Filipinos would sometimes try and play dead, um, and uh, sometimes the Colorado troops would oblige them. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but other times, but... I've got stereographs, you know, the little cards that go in a stereoscope. Um, I've got them showing U.S. soldiers with a funnel down a Filipino's mouth and they're pouring buckets of water into them. Um, ah. Yeah, waterboarding isn't water. new. Um, <laughs> but, but they thought it was quaint enough that it was a popular parlor photo in 1900. Um, sensibilities have changed somewhat in some quarters. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever happened. McCoy went back to business. Oh, yeah. 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 <coughs> he didn't get tarred and feathered. No. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much yes. again for joining us, and please stick around. You're welcome to come.